Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom pocket knife maker and designer, Evan Nicolaitis. Evan, the founder of Esnix Knives, has been making and designing slip joints and traditional folding knives since 2014. In that decade, he's reached an obvious level of mastery in design and build, and that is evident at first glance. His repertoire includes everything from his own unique slip joint patterns to modern takes on old Sheffield patterns, and perhaps most impressive to me, his absolutely luxe knife-centric multi-tools. Bringing things back down to earth, as of recently, the average knife junkie can get one of his, uh, one of Evan's Esnix knives made by the knowing makers at Riot. We'll find out how Evan got to this place in his career in only 10 years. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help support the show, uh, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. Evan, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. Uh, I've, I've been admiring your work since, I don't know, I, I would say since the, for the last three years or so, and um, especially your custom work uh, blows me away. Oh, We're going to talk about all this uh, and more. But uh, first, I want to ask you about the name Esnix. Yep. Uh, so it's kind of a play on my name. Uh, if you see the sign right over here, it's Evan S. Nicolaitis. So I uh, figured it'd be kind of hard to fit that on a tang of a slip joint. So I <laughs> stylized it, shortened it a little bit. All right. That works for me. I, I, I like it. I saw the NY. I was like, does that have anything to do with nah? Yep. Uh, all right, cool. I like it. Esnix knives. Well, uh, as I mentioned up front, you've been making pocket knives for about ten years, uh, according to information on your on your yeah, site. Up, uh, December twenty fourteen. I think I made my first first knife. Yeah, twenty fourteen. Well, tell me tell me how you got started. What what gave you the gumption to to jump in? So um, I was kind of uh, looking for a hobby when my buddy start, my buddy got me into pocket knives i was doing some woodwork and like whittling and stuff at the time um and i ended up uh getting into them through great eastern cutlery knives he mm -hmm. he showed me a uh, traditional boys knife from gec and i fell in love with it um up to that point i had really only carried knives for fishing and um you know some you know uh, you know, had one in my tr in my car or something like that, but never not, didn't usually carry one in my pocket. But that really spoke to me. Uh, ended up doing some research, looking into starting to collecting a little bit, and found this old Shell Barlow on uh, on eBay for like four bucks. I didn't know what I was getting, and when it when I got it, it had those shell handles on it, so they were hollow. I was like, I bet you I could put some new handles on it. Um, swapped those out, had a lot of fun doing it, um, got involved in blade forums and posted some pictures of, of that knife and a couple others that I'd done that to, and people really liked it. So I kept doing it and ended up selling modified knives on blade forums, uh, and doing that over and over again, Buy, bought a ton of GECs up and modified them and sold them on blade forums. It got to the point where I was doing absolutely everything on it, but making the blade in the spring, um, you know, soldering my own bolsters, doing no relieved liners, doing hand rubbed finishes on the blades and everything. And uh, <laughs> I figured, you know, may as well. So that's when I got into it. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. I, I think of people like Jeff Blauvelt and uh, with tough knives and, um, and also uh, Birdvis knives. He started out that way too. Uh, what a great way to get to know uh, all the the best and worst of the various knives that you're taking apart. And yeah, really get an idea of how you want to go forward. What was it about the first uh, GEC boys knife? I have a couple 
uh, one of which is my favorite slip joint period in my collection besides the one my grandpa gave me. Um, what is it about G that GEC, that first one that that uh, made you fall in love? What was it about it? I don't know. Uh, up to that point, uh, I hadn't really handled life with what felt like soul. You know what I mean? Uh, I had some nice gab on ebony and the walk and talk and just the, the feel of it. And, you know, the nice sheep's foot blade. I, it just spoke to me. For, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't i had modern knives but i wasn't really into them all that much you know i just used them as a tool but that was just like i don't know just spoke to my soul and i fell in love yeah uh th there is something about uh well the the connection to the past with slip joints uh to me materials because when you mentioned the uh the boy's knife uh, the first GEC I got was a number 15 and it was a the farmer boy's knife and I had a, a full size spade blade along the clip point. And the autumn jig bone scale is to me that like I could stare at it for days. Um, yeah. And that's what drew me in. Yeah. Uh, I've got a, a stash of TC Barlow's in my, <laughs> in my drawer over there. Like, 70 of them or something like that i love that pattern uh love a barlow love a classic knife it's just there's something to it okay so you've been modding uh <clears throat> pocket knives doing everything except the blades yeah. so decide you're going to start making blades how, yeah. how did how did that work uh well while i was modifying i mean i had a full-time job it was you know a, a hobby that just happened to make me some money and i basically reinvested everything into getting better and better tools um uh i mean they, they weren't great they were harbor freight <clears throat> tools that first knife i ground was like on a one by 42 used craftsman belt grinder <laughs> so uh so i'd upgraded from the one by 30 harbor freight um <laughs> and uh yeah it it just you know by that point, I'd gotten comfortable enough doing modifications and everything. I felt like I had a good understanding of the geometry of the knife. Uh, come to realize I didn't when it came to designing <laughs> my own stuff um, compared to, I guess, what I've learned over the years. Uh, and yeah, I just, you know, just a growth on, on what I love doing. So uh, you say that once you started designing your own stuff, things that you thought you knew um, presented themselves differently. Uh, yeah. How so? So uh, that was a quick learning curve, basically. After those first, when I when I told people that I was going to start making custom knives, I basically took on like ten orders immediately, and um, each one of those was a different knife design, and I didn't really know how i was going to design them uh, i think i was just scribing them on like drawing them out on paper and sticking it to steel uh well i quickly learned that i my my geometry was all wrong and my proportions were all over the place you know my pin locations and the size of the tang and how it sat in the knife and all of this needed refinement that was like a quick lesson so i started drawing them on the computer uh, so I could get the idea of how things were going to sit in different positions. And from there, uh, just, you know, tuned things up better, better as I went along. Um, but yeah, that was like, okay, I can't just wing it with this. I need to be able to see how this is going to look, uh, how these things are going to fit together, where things are going to sit in what positions and everything, you know, because if you've got a different angle on the back of your tang when you're designing a knife and you don't take that into consideration when you're putting it together you know you're not going to have it sit at 90 at the half it might be sitting at a, a weird angle and it doesn't look right uh and i wanted it to look right so um, yeah i took that next step into into the design elements of it so was it those 10 initial orders breathing down your neck that um inspired you to look into cad or Oh, I, I I still haven't. I still don't work on CAD. I actually got this program called uh, SketchUp. 
and mm -hmm. one of the one of the programs in it is called layout so it's it lets me draw in 2d and rotate off a set point and that's pretty much all i needed <laughs> so <laughs> i could rotate the the blade around the pivot and that's all i wanted out of the program and i use it to this day <laughs> uh, i'm really fast with it and i just i haven't taken the time to learn cad or fusion 360 i've got i'm staring at it right there there's fusion auto desk <laughs> fusion but i just haven't taken the time it it seems like a slip joint in particular wouldn't require it whereas as soon as you start adding a folding lock bar that comes in at some angle you know and then now you're dealing with things that are uh, off that 90 degree sort mm -hmm. of uh format I, I could see needing that 3d uh, but it's kind of inspirational to hear that that you are making the stuff you're making and designing it on a relatively simple thing. It it you just need to see how to make it, how to put it together. But really, it's coming together in your hands or yeah, with I, your hands. I mean, I've gotten more advanced in my designs. Uh, you know, I'll, at first it was just the profiles with. You know the the pivot the the holes for the pins and then you know then i'm designing where i'm going to put the nail neck and the swedge and the plunge line how i'm going to plate lay the plunge on out and then i'm designing shields and uh you know bolsters and making the whole thing look like a finished knife in the drawing you know as a 2d monochromatic drawing but uh to give myself a better idea and uh yeah, I mean, it's it uses similar aspects uh, as you know AutoCAD, but it's just what I'm used to, and I, it, I'm so fast with it that I just <laughs> I can't stop using it. I, I it's like if I it, if I want you know I I'd have to take a lot of time to sit there and work through another program to get as efficient as I am with this one. Mm -hmm. and it's like is it really that worth it for me to do that eventually it will be um i'm just not haven't made you know uh taking that step yet well right now it's the right tool for the job if you were um if you were doing cnc milling which i don't think you i want to ask you about your process actually tell yeah because I, yeah, I guess you would need that kind of um you know ability to program and that kind of thing but uh so tell me about how you make it you come up with a design now i'm going to make this knife uh we i can't remember speaking to slip joint maker on this show strange as that may uh, sound though um uh, you know designers for sure um but tell me how you make a slip joint and how you make a slip joint so uh start on the computer uh you know i whether it's you know coming up with a new design or whatever, uh, I what I what a lot of guys do and what I used to do is I used to print it on adhesive paper, cut it out and stick it to steel, and then go uh, cut it out on a bandsaw. But I got a laser, a fiber laser, um, about a year and a half ago, and that's been a game changer because I could now laser my patterns straight onto the steel. It's uh, you know a permanent mark unless I grind it off and it lets me you know sets my guidelines straight from my drawing i don't have paper that's ungluing and shifting around mm. uh so then i cut them out drill the holes uh do any if i need to surface grinding before heat treatment cut my nail nicks in so then i've got my blade and my spring ready for heat treatment take it through the heat treatment process uh straighten them out surface grind them and then I start working on my liners. So I'll have my liners, which I'll, if, if it's, uh, a, a, you know, a prototype pattern, I'll laser that out as well and cut it out. Once I've kind of dialed the pattern in, I will get them water jet because I don't really see the point of standing in front of a bandsaw for hours and hours and hours, just mm -hmm. cutting steel. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's not cost effective, uh, where it's water jets relatively cheap and, I don't, you know, there's not much skill to cutting a band, cutting steel on a bandsaw. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, then I'll I'll uh, laser my pattern, my 
liner pattern onto the steel as well. Actually, I've got one, some examples over here. Give me one second, I'll grab one. Sure. Uh, one thing I, I'm curious about, uh, which we'll, we'll uh, double back to, is the heat treatment of the spring and the blade. And are they different? Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. So this is actually for the exhibition knife that I'm bringing to, let me see if I can get that. Atlanta. Oh, yeah. You can see how that's lasered on there? Yes. I've got lock bars over here. I actually had to buy a bigger lens for my laser in order to, to laser this. That's how big this knife is. This is the biggest knife I've ever, I'll have ever made. And you can see the size of those. Oh, liners. Wow. Oh. oh, cool. Yeah, this is this is going to be a cool knife. Yeah, uh, I could I could see the the blade. Um, you know, not to you know, it it kind of reminds me of a bayonet. It's got that bayonet sort of grind because of that long swedge. I yeah. know it's uh, I know it's a, a, a it looks like a kind of a take on a classic um, spear point. Yep, it is. Um, and so it's uh, it's one of those old Sheffield multi blade knives, right? So it's an exhibition fishing knife and it's got a giant spear blade it's seven inches closed wow huge knife wow uh biggest knife I'll, biggest folding knife i'll ever i'll have ever made uh so that's gonna be fun so is so, this uh is this a, a new pattern that you're trying out or is this a commission or i, I don't even know if you do commissions but i mean is this uh yeah this how, how did this come about one. um just you know but but continuation down my line of making crazy knives that I shouldn't be making. <laughs> so. You should be, you should be making all these. Hang on. Uh, before we move on, uh, there's something I don't want to forget to ask you, which is uh, the spring and the blade, you know, yep. you're cutting out of the same piece of steel, but are, do they get heat treated differently? Yes. So there is a uh, different tempering for the spring and the blade. So you're trying to hit different hardnesses for them. Okay. Uh, for example, with the blade, you might temper it at uh, 350, 400 degrees, and the spring might be, depending on the steel, of uh, you know, 1100, 1150, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's also, I've got liquid nitrogen over there for cryo treating. Um, that helps continue the conversion uh, through the heat treatment process and uh, refine the, uh, the what's it convert the Austin type to Marston type or the other way around? I forget which. <laughs> I'm not a metallurgist. I just I trust that. you either way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then from there, uh, profile everything. Start start working on the timing of the blade, which is uh, you know the open half and closed position. Try to get that as flush as possible, and uh, once I've got that going, I start building the handles. So I've got my two liners. I'll, if I'm soldering bolsters on, I'll do that. If I'm doing a shadow pattern, I'll glue the, uh, the scales on. If I need to process the material, which I do most of the time, because I like using vintage uh, materials with uh, vintage uh, micardos and whatnot, mm. um, I'll, I'll mill them down to thickness, glue liners on it, G10 liners if I want to add some color, and then glue them onto the steel or titanium or whatever I'm using. Um, and then get the shape down, right? So that I've got my profile of my handle and then I'll measure for the shield. So I'll make sure to line that up, try to get that as dead center as I can, take it over to my pantograph, which is right there hmm. and cut my shield out and cut the pocket for the shield for the handle, drop that in. And at that point, that's usually when I go grind my blade. So, uh, after I've got my handles kind of finished, uh, I'll do the last little bit of the timing for the tang. Cause once you've got the scales on it and you drill them back out, it, things move just a little bit. So you want to redo the timing on the tang to make sure that it's perfect. And then at that point I go and grind the blade hand rub and put it together. 
So uh, is there is there a part of that process where um, uh, I think I've heard it called hafting or yep. uh, wh where you're kind of making everything uniform? Yeah. So that's when, when uh, usually right after I put the shield in. So um, once the shield's in, if I've got to do like shadow bushing or anything like that, after that, then I go and I shape the handle. Uh, and depends on how there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. I've done flat and chamfered handles. I've done, here's a pretty cool shape to a handle that I've started doing on this knife. It's hard to do. Is that tortoise shell? This is actually bake light, but bake see that, that ridge that goes down it? Wow. Yeah. So that's cool. It just gives it some cool angles to it. Yeah. But this stuff's awesome. Look at that. That is gorgeous. What is this model? This is my stingray pattern. Let's see the blade. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was looking at this one in particular uh, on your Instagram. Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, what do you call that? Is that a Warren Cliff or is that a. Yeah, it's like a modified Warren Cliff. God, that's beautiful. Yeah, thanks. And it's got a stop pin in it, which okay. lets me get rid of the tang. I'll try to get this light. There we go. You can see that normally there's a tang here with a kick, mm -hmm. but I put a stop pin in it, allowing me to kind of sink that into the frame and get that much more edge, a single focus out of that. So I the, love how the pivot pin, I'm sorry, I just noticed how the pivot pin also follows that arc, the whole thing. Man, that is, that is something yeah, the, else. The shield does as well, goes the whole way down. So that ridge. Let me see if this will help. Come so, on. bake light is a is a form of uh, old micarta. What is bake light again? Um, it's like uh, like the original plastic, I guess. Um, it's pretty tough stuff, though. So I was pleasantly surprised when I started working with it, how durable it is. And um, I thought it was going to be, you know, start like melting and burning when I was yeah. using it. Uh, that wasn't the case at all. It's pretty tough stuff. Uh, holds its shape really well. Um, it doesn't move all over the place when you're working with it. And uh, it's it they've held up the ones that i put together i think the last the first one i made was for blade last year and as far as i know that's held up well and it, I, it I seems to take an, held up. it seems to take a real nice polish too oh beautiful polish it finishes really nicely and it doesn't scratch up as easily as you'd think either so it's i've been pleasantly surprised by it so when it, you're you're a uh custom slip joint knife maker who does multi-bladed um knives and and i want to i, I want to talk about the your your multi-tools uh but first uh just in terms of making a slip joint that has say two blades or three blades does that present uh, i saw a beautiful congress style or it looked kind of like a congress um on your on your uh, instagram and made me wonder it does having another spring in there and having uh, another uh, group of tools change the calculus, make it a lot oh, more yeah. difficult? Oh, yeah. Um, one thing that Tony Bowes always said was that if you start getting bored, add another blade. Um, <laughs> like it that. just completely <laughs> complicates everything. Uh, once you start have to, once you start having to crank blades to get them out of the way, offset grind things to make sure that everything clears. Um, it, it adds a total, totally new element. When, you know, two blades on the same spring have to clear yeah. each other. Yeah. It's, yeah, that, it's that's a lot more complicated. That sort of grinding is very, uh, it's amazing to me, or I don't know if it's grinding, but that sort of blade design where you're making one that kind of cants off one way and one, yeah. and then they nestle in there. That's, uh, so 
do you do all that kind of uh, planning also in yeah. uh, that in uh, SketchUp? You can. Well, I, I'm I'm just looking at it from the profile, right? But I know um, how I'm going to crank them over, depending on what kind of knife I'm doing. Say it's like a cattle knife, which is a three blade, similar to a stockman, but the blades are in front of the master blade instead of behind it. That just adds another oh. element of complexity to it because you've got to make sure you can access all of the nail nicks uh, from the the uh, mark side, which it would be the, the front side or show side of the knife. Um, you just need to know how much you're going to crank it over, and then you've got to take into consideration the thickness of the blade stock, the thickness of the center liner, um, and then kind of figure out where you want it to sit in the frame so that it's not going to hit either of the blades around it. So did you uh, embark on making multi-bladed or at least two-bladed knives because you got bored or felt like you kind of had uh, mastered the single blade? and Or is that the kind of knife that you've always loved and couldn't wait to make? Yeah, I... I, I did it because I didn't know better. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> didn't know that I had no business making a split back Whitler for my, you know, 20 something. It's knife. I, I didn't know. Um, it, cause I just love those knives. I, I love a multi-bladed knife. Uh, I, you know, I used to carry them all the time. They're just the, the, uh, complexity of, um, fascinates me. And, um, the, the history behind it too is really cool and the, the, the very deliberate purpose to the knives uh and what it, that that becomes even more interesting when you start looking at the super complex sheffield exhibition knives and stuff like that and what they were doing with these knives 150 years ago 200 years ago making these extremely complicated knives with you know, on stone water wheels by candlelight, basically. Oh, it's geez. Nuts. nuts. What nuts. were what were they making? What how did these multi bladed uh, knives originate, and what were they for? Well, uh, they had a lot of different purposes. Like for example, the one that I'm working on for the show, I've got an example of a smaller one here. This is a uh, an exhibition fishing knife. So this, you've got a locking main blade on it. Mm -hmm. and you've got two tools here so you've got a this is basically a saw but it's a descaler with a hook remover and then a pen blade here so this alone this is like a lockback whittler basically which is already complicated and then on the back you have a corkscrew <laughs> and a leather punch And then a flathead. Wow. And then, <laughs> just for fun, on this side, you've got toothpick, Get here. tweezers, and over here, under the scale, a set of scissors. Get out of here. That yeah. is so cool. Who made this? This is uh, Wassenholm, George Wassenholm. Sheffield, England, probably really early 1900s. Wow, it's in looks like it's in amazing yeah, shape. It's in, it's in great shape. Um, I was really lucky to find this example um, for me to be able to check it out and so kind of model the one that I'm building off of that. You called it an exhibition fish knife. Did, what does that mean by exhibition? Uh, I think that's just what the well, it comes out of it. Uh, I found it in the Sheffield Exhibition Knives book, oh. uh, which is, I mean, it sent me down this rabbit hole uh, that's just, <laughs> uh, I love I love making these things, but it's just like, sent me down this path, this trajectory that I can't pull myself away from because I love doing it. <laughs> um, and they're, they're just fascinating knives. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of been combing through there over the last few years. Like one of these days I'm going to have to make this knife. I'm going to have to make this knife and took the plunge 
for I think it was for Blade West twenty two. That's when I made made the first knife I wanted to out of that book, and have kind of picked one from there for each show I've gone to since then. And now I'm starting to design some uh, of my own designs based off of you know those old Sheffield knives. So there was one that I made for the Arts and Metal show. And I don't know if you can see it. Oh, let's see. Hear it clearly. <clears throat> but this is based on my Stingray pattern. Yeah. And I call it the Stingray Sportsman. So, so this has a corkscrew made. and all, a, a fingernail, a file and tool, a little yep. worn cliff. Yeah, it's got a little hawk's bill, like a manicure blade, uh, the yeah leather punch, the corkscrew, and it's hard to tell, but the spring mechanism here is really cool because it's the main spring. It almost acts as a whittler over here, oh, but yeah. instead of having a center liner, this spring steps down on both sides and acts as the liner for the other two blades. Or all the other four blades actually is that an yeah. innovation of yours or is that a technique you're borrowing or that's a, i was adapting? pulling a little bit of something out of multiple different knives that i've seen and kind of putting it all together with my own spin on it so an innovation that's that's pretty wild that you're innovating on something so kind of uh old and um you know we we use its uh sort of ancestors now you know i carry mm. swiss army knife all the time this is this is sort of like the pre that uh there there's one on your website i believe that uh when i saw it this is the one that really made me um uh, like really fall in love with your multi-bladed kind of knives it looked like something that would be uh in a picnic basket to me uh in the 1800s somewhere you know with big hats and old <laughs> clothes and stuff it just had uh, that's why i said lux to me it just looked like it because it has an ivory looking knurled kind of little patch on on one of the scales and it has a corkscrew and all of the things you would need for a very okay. civilized uh i think picnic. that's this one here so this yes, one would sir. be it's got i uh westinghouse ivorite micarta and I, it's got checkered handles. So I do yes, the, the gun stock checkering on it. Um, this is based off of, there's one page in that book that's got a lot of these sportsman, sportsman knives. Mm -hmm. And I kind of pulled some features from a few of them that I liked and combined it to make this one. So on the back side, I see those three tools uh, projecting out of the same pivot yeah. and all a corkscrew. But what's the one in the middle? The, the one in the middle is called a, gimlet it's kind of like a drill bit okay so you can kind of like set a hole in wood um you can kind of drill into it you could also drill into leather uh and yeah it's kind of like a uh a cowboy knife to a degree or just like you know working on a on a farm uh, for you to be able to do all sorts of stuff. There's yeah. one that has just like this, but with a hoof pick that wraps wraps around it, and that's called a horseman's knife. So this is very similar to that one. Are these regular models that you make, or no? Is these that... are going off. They're, they're, one off. Yeah, they take a take a while to make, and they only make probably like three complex knives a year, like that. So I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for a friend. But uh, do you do custom orders, or or is this a... uh, not not really? I kind of make things uh, as I like to as I go along. Um, but I am going to be trying something new with like a waiting list for my site, where you can sign up for the waiting list, but instead of just you know being on a list and being offered whatever the next thing is that I made. Uh, I'm going to break it down by different categories and different patterns and you'll kind of be able, you know, I'll have like five spots for this pattern and you can sign up for that specific pattern if you want that. And that'll help me organize it and kind of give anybody signing up, you know, 
a little you know a little bit of a customized option for what they want and i'll offer things like if you want want it screwed together or pinned together i think i'll break it down into those two categories for each pattern but i think that'll be a cool way to do it moving forward i think if i can open that up late this summer yeah i like i like that idea because it's uh, or I, I could see how from your perspective, it would be a great way to do it because you can line up, line certain things up, li like line up a certain amount of customers. Yep. You can um, you can kind of guarantee that you're going to make five of these, five of these, five of these. So you can kind of uh, organize uh, yeah. your produ production that way. And um, and also it gives people a little bit more of a chance uh, to get your work. Yeah, to get what they want to. Right. Uh, the way I've got it set up now with my waiting list, um, I'll make a knife and then offer it to the next person in line. And what I've been finding is that they're like, oh, I was really hoping for mm -hmm. a beer buster or oh, I was really hoping for a workhorse or something like that. And I'm like, well, all right, I'll mark down next to your name what pattern you want next time I want. You know, next time I make one for the waiting list, I'll offer that up to you and see what you like. And uh, I think it'll save me a lot of time emailing person after person and then until somebody comes up that, that wants that knife that pattern specifically or you know and and like you said it'll help me organize like if i want to make five of this knife for the five people on that knife's waiting list i could do that and, you know um yeah it'll make things easier i think for everybody so uh that's that's one thing that i always like hearing about how people's uh business model evolve uh and by people i mean knife makers how how they kind of um well how the business end of things grow mm -hmm. uh, uh but uh you mentioned the beer buster um that's one of your probably the first pattern that i was like what is this uh, you know because i come in and out of slip joint phases mm -hmm. i collect everything and uh i'd say like every two years i get hot and heavy with slip joints and uh, i think the last time is is when i fell in love with the beer buster tell me about your uh we talked about some of your real exotics here but what about your um kind of work a day patterns your stingray what else do you have beer buster and yeah the, the beer buster was my original like my first original design um and i designed it because i didn't want to have two blades on a knife where we, you know instead of having a cap lifter blade i wanted to put it in the handle and I wanted it on a working knife. So I was like, what better knife to put that on than on, a, on the, the sod buster style knife? Um, so I did that and people liked it and I kept making them. And um, yeah, now there's, I've got production models on the Beer Buster Junior and on the Beer Buster. So that's pretty cool. Is, is that your most popular model? Uh, I don't know. Um, on the production knife side, the workhorse has been the most popular, and that they just did an amazing job with that knife. All right, let's talk about that. You say they, you're talking about Ria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Oh, excuse so me. This is the prototype. The production model. Oh, here. Actually, th these are coming out at Blade. So I've got the frame lock workhorse. Oh, that is cool. So this one, I mean, they, they have black PVD. I, I actually ended up sandblasting it and anodizing it <laughs> in the back <laughs> spacer. But um, yeah, these they did an amazing job with these. The action is incredible. And the, uh, the micarta version actually won best in show at Blade Texas for wow. factory knives. That was, that was a nice surprise. Congratulations. That's... Yeah, thanks. That's awesome. Well, what what has it been like working with Riyadh? How did that? How do you go from laboring on these jewels and then relinquishing your work to a company? How's that work? Well, um, I was. I mean, first of all, they've been great to work with. Their quality of work is amazing. I didn't really uh, have. I wasn't really planning on having any knives made in China. Uh, but once I saw the quality and the price of them, I was like, that, how, how could you beat that? It, they're making knives nicer than some custom guys. You know what I mean? It's, oh, yeah. it's incredible. Um, so I started out with the Beer Buster Junior, 
and I did a short run. When did we drop that? We'll say early 22, like a small batch of them. Um, those did well, and then got some more orders in, and they've been kind of rolling through ever since. You know, they take about like a year, a year plus uh, to get an order in. But uh, yeah, so and we've got more that are coming out here soon. Here's here's another one that's dropping next week. This is the tarpon. So this is the next slip joint model coming out. Let me try to get a good light on that. Look at that. So this is a slip joint. If you're listening, it kind of has a what? Kind, how would you describe the handle? Man, that's. It's a it's it's like a curved jack trapper style uh bigger knife. It's about four and an eighth inch. Let me check. I think it's four and an eighth. Four and a quarter closed. M390 hand rub satin blade with a long pull and a nice cut swedge, uh integral titanium bolsters and a checkered G10 handle. So if you've seen my Barracuda. This is like it's big brother. Just Hi. really nice checkered G10, really grippy, nice snappy action, beautifully flush. I mean, they do an amazing job. God, that looks nice. So that that is G10. Is that green? I, I can't quite it's, tell. It's gray. It's like oh, gray. A, okay. It looks kind of like the titanium a little bit. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. But it's G10. So uh, they're nice. Let's look at the uh, the blade real quick. I, I I really like this blade. At it's seems like a very useful uh, design. You've got uh, kind of two straight areas. It's almost uh, got the utility of a an Americanized tanto in kind of a way uh, yep, because uh, after the 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 belly there is a belly, so it's not really like that. But you've got two straight portions that both seem uh, really really. Uh, useful yeah. and then you've got the point just dropped a little bit uh with that swedge it looks like you can get into anything you can pierce anything with this yeah uh I, I really like the blade design yeah thank you um this is yeah it's kind of, it's a shape i've kind of carried over to a few things so i've got it on my my beer buster my workhorse and on this one that just you no know, it's uh this was a little bit longer and more slender the workhorse and beer buster a little bit more aggressive um but yeah i really like that it's i call it more of an aggressive drop point i guess um but you know as i've been putting them out people are calling it like tanto ish i guess it is uh but it does have that little bit of belly that yeah. that you can do a little bit of work with i think it, i think it's a great all-around blade shape uh, you know, something I haven't noticed much of uh, are clip points. Mm -hmm. You you don't seem to do many clip points. Uh, am I right? I see a lot of straight, uh, like worn clips, a lot of straight edge. Uh, I see uh, drop points. And then on that one um, Stockman that's on uh, your landing page of your website, it's got, it's got this really cool sheep's foot uh, on it, kind of sharp, pointy sheep's foot. Yeah, that uh, one's the native blade. So that's based off of, uh, that main blade is based off of Jared Oser's native pattern. Oh, it's got okay. that Santoku style blade. Um, but I do have a clip point design. That one I just finished the other day. Here it is. That's my snook pattern. Oh, what is uh, that handle? First of all, before you open it, roof line jig bone. So some bone I jigged and dyed myself. That's beautiful. Get this in focus properly. Is that sort of a mahogany color? Yeah, it's it's like an amber with. There we go. Oh yeah, amber with some nice dark brown in the recesses. But yeah, this has got it's almost a trailing clip. Oh yeah. That's like a that's exotic. It's a it's got a little bit of a I don't know Persiany feel. Yeah, a little bit. That is stunning. And this is the second version of it. 
because I put the I installed the stop pin to get that extra blade length. So some of them you use the kick, some of them you use a, a stop pin. I've actually redesigned them all except for the Barracuda to have the stop pin now, just because I mean you get so much more blade out of it. Like I, I could just hide that tang back there. I put my mark on the spine, which let's see if it'll show up. You know, I, I until yeah, this conversation okay. never thought about that. I've made the distinction. I've, I've uh, noticed the difference mm -hmm. between a modern slip joint using a stop pin and a traditional style slip joint using the kick, uh, but never realized why. I just, you know, uh, but the fact that the tang on a traditional does take up a big chunk of blade yeah. length, and you can go all the way to the edge or all the way to the. Uh, bolster yep if you're using and, the stop pin i mean a lot of people that use a stop pin will still have a little tang there but um the laser is kind of what got me to start doing that uh and it started with this design too so i was like i, I really wanted to design the knife based off of the boy's knife with a a, a straight edge um and could it get it to work right with the kick because I was worried about over travel and blade wrap. Hmm. Um, so I designed it with a stop pin. And then while I was at it, I just pushed the tang back and got, you know, I'd recently gotten a laser. So I was like, I'll put my mark somewhere else. You know, I've got a laser now. I don't need to stamp it on something. Um, and I got, you know, you get like an extra quarter inch of edge. Yeah, it's great. Wow. And you can drop it down in there low and, not have to worry about it the edge hitting the hitting the back spring it's i mean all around <laughs> you know it's not technically you know traditional but i think it's an improvement yeah yeah uh, that to me as a, a slip joint owner who sometimes spends more than he should on something uh you want to know that when it's closing and you hear it thwack shut that there's no way that that edge, yeah. you know because there how many times you do you check that edge you just to make sure that did i hear blade wrap yeah, yeah you're that you totally uh divorce yourself from that at that point uh i i want i want to ask you um about uh, you mentioned when you started making knives it was a hobby you had a day job it, it evolved you really worked into it through the modding thing um 10 years later uh you have a successful knife company um do you still have your day job is this a full-time job uh how has your business grown to this point uh yeah this is this is what i do now um i've been full-time again now for about uh couple of years i think right around two years and um yeah before that uh i took a two-year break from summer 2019 to summer of 21 then i got back into it i was still doing some real estate stuff i was um doing uh like remodeling and uh for with investment properties and whatnot and uh got back into knives and made you know completely switched over because I, I i i got the bug again <laughs> so, well how would you how would you compare this industry to the industry you left um it's totally different you know i was doing i was still working with my hands which was nice but uh there wasn't you know there is art i guess too remodeling a house or something like that but it's not the same thing um not even close uh this is a lot of fun knives are it's a crazy industry you don't know what direction it's going to go especially when you start thinking about the production model side you have no idea which way the market's going to go and you know you think you, you pick something like black micarta you think it's going to be a nice neutral always popular thing and then all of a sudden black my car does not popular anymore and you're like what how did that happen <laughs> you know <laughs> carbon fibers back in and then as soon as you know if you try to chase it it's not going to work for you because by the time you get something to market mm. based chasing off a trend the trend is going to be gone it's going to be in a completely different direction so i think you just got to do 
do your own thing and go the way you want to go. And if people like your stuff, they're going to like your, you know, that's how, how you do it. If you keep trying to chase the market, you're never going to catch it. It's like zigging and zagging. You don't know where it's going to go. It's very hard to predict. Uh, I've just found that the best way to do it for myself is just kind of make something that I like and put it out there and uh, see how people respond to it. And it's, I've, you know, I've gotten a good reception so far, so I'm pretty happy with it. I, I think that uh, really knives, custom knives really have to be well-made. If they're well-made, there are enough knife junkies out there i'll say enough knife people like me who collect who if they like your design and it's well made i'm not saying you're gonna have a thriving career i'm not saying you can even do it for a living but uh there will be people to buy your knives if it's well made because man i have seen some crazy designs and i'm like but this guy's a full-time knife maker and and they are super super well done it's just the designs are like i can't imagine owning one myself but there are people out there who like this design and just knowing yeah. that it's well done uh, is the is this deal sealer yeah yeah exactly i mean there's wild stuff out there that you know isn't my taste at all but somebody loves it you know maybe a lot of people love it and uh yeah but it's kind of like you know it's art you, you like what you like and um if you the the best art it comes from yourself you know what i mean it's, it's something that you like you're not trying to force it it comes naturally and you put it out there and uh if if you know if it's done well and designs you know somebody's gonna like you know uh, not necessarily everybody's going to like every design, you know, not every design is good, but if it, it, it's, I think when it's, uh, comes out naturally, it is a better design. You know, it's, it's born from your passion and what you love to do and not something that you're trying to force. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I think it comes out, you know, it's a, it turns out better in the end. And if you're dealing with production schedules, like at least a year out, like you were saying with Riot, and you're trying to chase the material trends, um, that that could be tricky, you know. Yeah. To by the time your production is is uh, ready to ship to to the end end line user, you know those those materials are totally out, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, and that that's something uh, more new to me uh, that I'm starting to figure out, like. For example, on these, I just really liked the checkering. I love checkering on a handle. I think it's some of the best grip that you can get on a knife handle, and um, I don't see it out there too often. Uh, it's something I've been doing on my customs for a while, and, and they were able to checker G10. So I was like, all right, let's go for it. Um, so we'll see. I, I, people have liked them on the Barracuda so far. Um, and, yeah, these are coming out, I think, next week aggressive price point too we're trying to get them up for like 265 oh nice so, that'll be uh, nice uh is it safe to assume that we're gonna see more um uh folding uh liner locks uh frame locks in your future in the yeah. next future yeah um well i started making my own uh modern folders i call them um First ones I made, I brought to Blade, Texas. So I made my first liner locks, my custom ones. And uh, I've got more on the bench right now that I'm bringing to Atlanta. Um, I've got a lot of production projects going on. Another one that um, we're releasing in Atlanta, I'm working with Justin Lundquist. Uh, we're starting, uh, we started a little company together, Daedalus Knife Co. Ooh. And we've come Icarus's out. Icarus's father. <laughs> Yep, exactly. So we've come out with oh, that's cool. uh, a little liner lock, front flipper. That is sweet. And it's that's got sort of that um, uh, trapper style handle. That is yep. beautiful. So this is like uh, modernized, you know, modern traditional style. Uh, 
checkered aluminum handles on it. Oh, I love aluminum. I think it this seems like a match made in heaven. I, I've never spoken with Justin, but just looking at his designs and uh, and your designs, and they both have a sleekness and a modernity to them. Yeah. Um, and his reach forward and yours reach backward. And, I mean, in time, yeah. in a way. And it seems like a very good pairing. Yeah, and we get along great. And uh, yeah, we're coming at this one. You know, the, the market's really saturated right now with $300 uh, kind of boutique knives. Uh, yeah. So we're trying to come at it uh, a little bit more aggressive. You know, we went with aluminum handles instead of titanium, uh, 154CM instead of an M390 or S90V mm -hmm. or something like that, and come into market uh, at 150 bucks. So oh. that's that's what we were going for with this and yeah we've got a milled bent clip hidden lanyard pin the fuller on both sides so you can spidey flick it so what's it uh, i mean you said you guys get along very well but you both have very strong um design styles mm -hmm. what is it like designing a singular item with someone else who has their strong style um well I, it just came together. We pretty much agreed on everything that we put on the knife. So I was like, what do you think about this? Like, ah, I love it. All right, what do you think about this? Yes. Okay, let's do that. Uh, all right, what about this? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and it kind of just worked together. And you can see his design in it a little bit. You can see some of my design in it. Um, yeah. But it kind of comes together as a new thing. Even though we both have that little bit of modern, traditional blend in our work yeah. and in our designs. Um, so... I think it works works out great. I'm looking forward to getting these out there into people's hands and seeing what they think. Um, seeing the final product and putting it out there in Atlanta, that's going to be very exciting. And then future projects from there. Well, we know uh, Blade Show is in your immediate future if you're listening to this uh, as it's uh, being released. It's actually next week because this show will be airing June 2nd. Uh, <laughs> Say, did I lose? Oh, no. <laughs> I got to get back to work. <laughs> Sorry, I should never do that. Uh, uh, cause a little panic there. Uh, but um, uh, I just wanted to say, what's in your further out future? How do you see, you know, as we wrap here, how do you see Esnix, uh in in the far future? Um far future or i mean you know how do you want I mean, this to evolve i i want to have knives produced here in the u.s whether if i open up my own shop and have some cncs running um to start a u.s manufacturing company here uh or working with somebody but i want to that's what i want to do i want to produce knives here super high quality stuff um based on my designs and then also continue making my customs so yeah that's oh, that's, i love that that's where i want to take it whether you know whether even if it's just you know me and another guy running cnc and doing kind of like a mac knives machine assisted customs if it's mm -hmm. if it's that that's fine but if you know if i can get a kind of a shop running and putting out good quality work and try to keep it you know reasonably priced but you know hot top quality that'd be that'd be ideal i'd love to do that well i think that's what um people like myself always love to hear because uh especially if you're you know acquiring a lot of knives sometimes you just want something from a designer and you need something from the cnc shop uh but knowing that you're still working by hand making these uh, awesome little slip joints and actually awesome large slip joints like that exhibition fish knife you're going to be bringing to blade show uh i think we're all going to be psyched about that evan nicolaitis of esnix knives thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast Absolutely. it's been thank a real pleasure thank you My... all righty sir take care you too
There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Evelyn, <laughs> Evelyn, Evan Nicolaitis of Esnix Knives. Uh, man, do yourself a favor, and if you're going to uh, to Atlanta, check out his knives uh, in person. That's He's going to be one of the first people I visit because I realize I have never uh, held one in hand. I've just gawked at them online. Um, and also keep your eyes peeled for the many uh, or, or for the growing number of Riot um, models coming out from him. So very exciting. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another conversation, Thursday Night Knives on Thursday, and of course, the Midweek Supplemental. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.